151, Introduction to Maple Syrup Production. Uh, it is a cold and snowy night up here in Lake Placid. Winter has, has now finally arrived. I know many people have already started tapping their trees and making maple syrup, but it looks like there's going to be a little bit of a break before they, they get to collect some more sap, uh, as winter is, is here for a little while at least this year. Uh, we are fortunate this evening to have Dr. Peter Smalls with us. Um, uh, Peter is a New York State Extension Forester, and he's director of Cornell University's Arnott Forest, a uh, 4,000-acre research um, and extension uh, center just south of campus um, in Van Etten, New York. And uh, Peter is, a, um, is an excellent forester and focuses a lot of his uh, research and extension efforts on on sugar bush management and, and and how to properly take care of our of our maple trees that we love so much. So uh, we're fortunate to have Peter with us tonight, and and he's going to give you a a nice introduction to sugar bush management, and then uh, an assessment on on how to uh, figure out how many trees you have for tapping on your property. So uh, thanks very much, Peter, and I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you all for joining me. This is very exciting. I've um, I've known about Cornell Small Farms program for quite some time, and I know they have uh, quite a, an array of very popular and effective um, online courses. This is the first one. Mike's Mike's cutting new ground, getting into kind of the natural resources arena with the online courses. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to participate in this. So as Mike said, my name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, so I work statewide in New York through the Cooperative Extension System, focusing on the management of rural woodlands. So whatever the output is from that rural woodland, whether it's uh, maple sap or timber or uh, recreation or wildlife, I work on uh, management to achieve some outcome from those woodlands. You can see my email address is pjs23. Feel free to send me an email. I'll also offer for you all, if you want to save a copy of this presentation, if you go to the file menu in the upper left-hand corner and go to Save As, you can save the document. You'll need to change that. The file type it defaults to is a UCF file type. Uh, so change it over to a PDF file type, and then you'll have this presentation. There's no audio with it. I'm recording it, and I'll post this. This will be posted on the beginning farmer web page, and I will also post it to... to that website, my uh, Forest Connect YouTube channel. So, but if you want a printed copy or a hard copy, please feel free to do that. There are two presentations. When we start the second one, I'll try to remind you to save that again, okay? So you all have, technically you all have microphone access. I've gone ahead and muted all of your microphones just because sometimes there's background noises and uh, it's distracting for others when there's when those background noises exist. So if you have a question, let's uh, let's start off by just having people type questions in. Make sure you send it to everyone so everyone can see the questions. The questions are are recorded, so other people that watch this will see those same questions. If as I'm answering it, if I need clarification, then maybe then we can turn on your microphone. But but kind of as a default, let's let's plan on having the the microphones. Uh, muted so that we don't have uh, background noise. Okay, let's get going with this. So this is going to be an introduction to maple syrup production. Um, or that's the name of the course. I'm going to be talking about an introduction to sugar bush management. So we're kind of at the at, at square one on how to manage the woods. So let's start by thinking about what the word manage is. And I didn't look up this definition. I made this one up, but it, I think it covers pretty well what we're talking about. It just gets our, our brain thinking about managing the sugar bush. And the sugar bush, of course, is the woods where we collect sap. And the, the, the basis of that wood, the, the origin of that, wo of that word is 
is um, it's the woods where the sugar is collected. And, you know, in, in the states we talk about we go into the woods or we go into the forest or we go out among the trees. In Quebec, where most of the maple syrup in the, U, in the North America is made, in the world is made, they talk about going into the bush, kind of like the Australians go into the bush. The, the uh, maple producers in Quebec go into the bush. So the bush, the woods that makes the sugar is called the sugar bush. And we want to manage that. Management is a way of controlling the flow and the utilization of resources and or limiting the negative consequences of actions. And this is relative to some kind of a desired outcome. So we know what we want to accomplish. That's implicit. And we want to make sure that we either enhance the good things or minimize the bad things relative to that desired outcome. Some, and, you, and you all manage stuff already, uh, whether or not you know it. So you manage your personal finances. Some people do a good job and others not so good managing their personal finances. If you have children, you try to manage them. Um, we don't actually accomplish that usually, especially as they get older, I'm finding. Um, and then, but you or you maybe you manage a family trip or a vacation. And so it's just you're making sure things happen the way you want them to happen. So why do we want to manage our sugar bush? First and foremost, it's an asset. This is the factory. The tree, the individual tree is the factory. The foliage is the, you know, the factory floor, if you will. It's where the sugar is made. And until we can collect that sap uh, from that factory, we're not going to be able to produce maple syrup. So it's, it's essential that just as, as um, any type of commerce that uses an industrial production facility is going to manage that facility, we need to manage our facility, and that's the sugar bush. And we can manage it in a way that it gets better, it increases in value, so it appreciates, or if we mismanage it, it will depreciate in value. Um, this is also the primary, uh, one of the primary controls over production. So if we want to produce more maple syrup, we have to have more maple sap, and, and we can increase the quality of the sap. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, in, in the quantity of sap. Tree health factors into that, and then there's the efficiency of the way we do things in the woods. So today I'm not going to really get into too much about the efficiency of operations in the sugar bush, but just basic basic elements of managing the sugar bush, so controlling the flow of resources. And the sugar bush has the potential to generate other kinds of revenue than just from syrup. Um, it may be firewood, it may be timber, it may be gourmet mushrooms, it may be ginseng. There's a lot of uh, potential revenue opportunities, and so management helps us ensure that we can optimize uh, each of those relative to whatever our desired outcome is. So as I'm going along, I just want to be conscious of the fact, if you have questions, please uh, type them in, and I will try and keep my eye on the chat pod. As questions come up, I will try to respond to those. If I don't, the good thing about the chat pod is the questions are saved, and when we get to the end, we'll have time to make sure we review all of those. So what is sugar bush management? The picture that you're seeing, this is a group of uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension educators out in the Arnott Forest sugar bush, and we're looking at trees. The gentleman in the green shirt is Steve Childs, the uh, New York State maple specialist, and we're talking about management uh, of that Arnott sugar bush. So sugar bush management is an ongoing process. It's not a, a one-off type of thing where you do it once and then you walk away. It's something that you need to be aware of and conscious of and attentive to. Now, you may have peaks and troughs in terms of how much effort you put into it, um, but, but it's an ongoing process. And over that, as time progresses, you're going to be required to, as you participate in this management, to have some deliberate allocation of time, interest, money, and energy and that forms an acronym TIME, T-I-M-E. So it's a way to think about it. So you're going to spend some amount of time. You have to have, hopefully you have some interest in it. If not, then maybe somebody in your family has interest in it and you can get them involved. It may require some money, although once you acquire the sugar bush, uh, I mean, you can still spend a lot of money in your sugar bush, but uh, the, the biggest cost is going to be the acquisition cost, and then there may be some other cost, but um, not necessarily. And then some amount of effort or energy is going to have to go into management as well. 
Uh, you'll want to be able to locate sources of assistance, and these include uh, technical issues. So you're going to need to know how to do things. You won't know how to do it, and you'll need to get technical assistance. Uh, you can get educational support, and at the very end, we'll talk about some financial resources that may be available. Okay, and so as we think about sugar bush management, this is just, you're, you're working within an entire system. When you're making maple syrup, you're working within a system, and that system starts at the tree, and it ends when you have a, a final product in its final package. And that final package may be maple candy, it may be uh, syrup in a bulk 15-gallon drum, but it, there's a final product that you're going to produce. So the sugar bush management is one part of that, and you need to think about how you're allocating all of your resources across that entire system. I'm not suggesting that it should be equal, but it should be conscious and deliberate uh, how much time and how much of your other your resources, your time, your interest, your money, and your energy are allocated to each of those different components. So I'm going to break out a few steps. Uh, and these steps we'll think about in terms of actions and benefits that will result in a healthier and more sustainable sugar bush. I think there's about seven of them total. And um, what I'm hoping that you will do is you will think about some of you have already been active in your in your sugar bush, I'm sure some of you haven't done anything in your sugar bush. So when, when we're going through each of these steps, you can think about which ones you think you need to do first, and I'll help with some of that converse, with that decision making, uh, with some suggestions, or if you've been active, maybe think about what you've done and what you need to do next. The first important starting point is to make a plan, and a management plan is important uh, because it's going to describe your objectives, and all of you will have the objective, of course, that you want to make maple syrup and collect maple sap, but you'll have other objectives as well. Maybe you want to grow gourmet mushrooms, maybe you want to cut firewood to fuel your evaporator, maybe you want to go cross-country skiing, or you want to have a nature trail for for school groups to come and visit in the summertime. Whatever, you're going to have things that you want to do, outcomes that you desire uh, from your sugar bush. Those are your objectives, and those need to be written down. And it may be that you have um, uh, a spouse or a sibling or an uncle or a child that's working with you in the sugar bush. Uh, everybody that's involved in the decision making processes need to have uh, need to record their objectives so that because because otherwise somebody's going to be involved in that process. They're going to have a desired outcome that they haven't articulated, and if it's not met, they're going to feel like they've been shortchanged in the process. So make sure everybody's communicating. A management plan will document your resources. Your resources in particular are the trees, but there are other kinds of resources. There may be equipment. There may be trail systems. There may be, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, aware of, um, you know, most of the woodlot owners don't have tubing systems, but your, your sugar bush plan could describe the tubing system that you have. So these are resources or things that you have some inherent value in and that you want to be able to maintain and maybe poss maybe expand. The management plan is going to have recommended practices, so those are things that you can do, and it's going to suggest a work schedule so you can prioritize those practices. And these are just suggestions, they're not obligations. This is not a, the work schedule is in no way mandatory. So the good news is, and I realize you, you all come from several different states. In New York, uh, it's the New York State DEC, but most states have a forestry, every state has a forestry agency, and most of those states will write this plan for free for your property. Uh, and um, so you need to start by getting a hold of your state forestry agency. I'm clicking my microphone on and off periodically. I have just a tickle in my throat. I don't want to cough into my microphone. So what are the benefits of the plan? We've kind of hinted at those. You'll have, I think, for me, the most important uh, piece is to have a prioritized work schedule. Because when you walk through the woods, and I do this 
in whatever woods I'm working in, whether it's a Cornell woodlot or my own woodlot, and I'm walking around, I just, my head is swimming with all of the things that I think I need and want to do. And so with a prioritized work schedule, you've went through, you've gone through a deliberate process to say, here's my objectives, here's my, um, so we have some video. Why don't you turn your videos off because that's going to slow down the feed rate. Um, and how you have a prioritized work schedule based on a, a deliberate process that you've gone through to, um, to, to come up with that. All right, so you'll also be able to benchmark the health of your sugar bush. Um, so you'll have done some assessment of insects and disease, and you'll know if you have high levels or low levels of problems, and then uh, you'll be able to monitor that through time. You'll also be able to monitor the growth of trees. This is important if you need to create a financial basis. Uh, in some cases, you may want to be able to document the, the starting value of your trees, and you'll have a, a document that will aid with uh, family discussions. So the template for a management plan is you'll have ownership objectives. You'll be able to describe the property, uh, the management units, the quantity, and the quality of the resources. Uh, you'll be able to um, uh, lay out and, and talk about any special attributes or any problems or concerns. Okay, so whoever's with us from Jack Sugar Shack, your video is turned on. I don't know if you know that. You can probably click the video icon to the right of your name. Thank you. All right, so some other aspects of your management plan template. Uh, it's going to talk about those necessary actions. So that's your, your work schedule. It may refer to resources and tools that you have available. And then it should include a series of maps. Certainly it have either an aerial photograph or a satellite image. These are images you can obtain online and, and your forester can provide. Soils information is available and road information is available. Uh, so the second thing that you're going to want to think about, your second kind of step in this process, is to know what your resource is. You can't manage something if you don't know what you have. And so in order to know what you have, you have to measure um, the important things. And you all have done this in, in other aspects of your life where you're, you know, you measure just if you look at your checking account, you're measuring how much money you have in your checking account. That's how you one way you go about managing your finances. So if we're trying to, to know what our resources in the sugar bush, one of the things, the types of things that we want to measure would be the numbers of trees, the types of trees. We're going to look at some identification uh, strategies here in just a minute. Tree age, tree size, how fast the trees are growing, and how quickly the tap holes heal. So those are all examples of the kinds of things that you'll want to measure. Now, if you work with your state forestry agency, they may not go in and do these detailed levels of measurements, but they can help you get started. Um, and then if you want uh, additional assistance, you can do it yourself, or you can work through a private consulting forester. Let's look at uh, identification of some of these. We'll start with red maple. Um, well, you're looking at a picture of red maple. The, the maples that we have available to us uh, in the, this is mostly in New York. I know I'm, uh, you all come from a broader range than just the Northeast. These are going to be fairly common in the Eastern and Midwestern states. So the maples we have include uh, the group that we known as the soft maples are red maple, silver maple, and box elder. They're, uh, the, one of the common features of those is that their fruit is produced in the spring. The hard maples are black and sugar maple, uh, those that 
are the seeds are produced in the fall. There's striped maple and then there's mountain maple that rounds out kind of the, the suite of native maples. And then there's some non-native maples like um, Norway maple that also can be used for maple sap production. What's uh, typical of these is that they all have opposite or paired leaves, and uh, other than box elder, they all have a simple leaf. Let me see if I can get my pointer going. So you can you can see the the simple leaf. This is this entire um, blade here from left to right is the leaf, is a leaf. Uh, the box elder has a compound leaf. We're not going to really talk about box elder. So the two key features of silver maple is that it has, um, where's my pen? So it has uh, sinuses, that's an awful color. It has sinuses, so if you look at these sinuses, are acute angles, right? So that's an acute angle, and it's a sharp angle. Um, the other thing that it has is the margin of the leaf is called serrate. And so the serrate means that it's toothed. So you can see these individual teeth that occur along the edges of these leaves. So that's the two distinguishing features of the foliage of red maple. Striped maple you see on the right-hand side is also called goosefoot maple. It has roughly three lobes that I'm outlining here, and it looks kind of like the shape of a goose's foot. This is what the bud of red maple looks like. On the left, it's a reddish bud and it's blunt. On the end, you can feel the bluntness when you touch it with the end of your thumb. And then the twig on the right looks like the twig of a striped maple, which tends to be more of a greenish brown, reddish brown, um, also with a blunt bud. The bark of red maple is platy. Uh, we'll describe the bark of sugar maple also as platy. The difference is red maple bark tends to exfoliate or peel from the top and the bottom. Uh, and if you were to rub your hand on that bark, it would, it would flake away as if you had a pepper grinder. So the best recognizable features, the BRF, reddish twigs, buds, and flowers, coarse but flaky bark, and the fruit is produced in the spring. Sugar maple, in contrast, you see the big picture on the left, uh, also has sinuses and lobes. And these sinuses, though, are rounded. You remember the sinuses on, uh, on red maple, as you see in the lower right-hand corner, those sinuses are acute. The other difference, the margin of the leaf, so this, this, the edge is called the margin, I'm trying to draw a straight line, has no serrations, no serrations, so it's called an entire margin. So those are the two big differences in the foliage. Sugar maple has entire margins versus serrate margins on red maple. Sugar maple has a rounded sinus versus the acute uh, sinus on red maple. The buds are also quite different. The buds on sugar maple are sharp and brown, and you can figure that out with the touch of your thumb. They're actually quite, it's a very solid feel, and you can uh, push on it with the end of your thumb and end up with a, you can feel the sharpness of that bud. Here they are in comparison, sugar maple the top, sharp and brown. You can see red maple in the middle and the Norway maple at the very bottom. Norway maple also has red blunt buds, but they're uh, large in size compared to the buds of red maple. The fruit is different as well. Uh, sugar maple fruit is the, and we're, when we look at the fruit, we're looking at the kind of the, the key, the outside edge. I'm not drawing very straight lines. On on sugar maple, they're described as being parallel. Now, when I look at those two lines, I don't see parallel, uh, but they're more parallel than the V shape that we see on red maple. So uh, slightly divergent parallel wings on sugar maple, V shaped on uh, parallel or slightly divergent on sugar maple, and then V shaped on red maple.
The bark of sugar maple is also called platy, but it's uh, platy and it exfoliates from the edge, not from the ends. And it's very tight, so if you were to rub your hand on it, it's very tight. Best recognizable features then are sharp pointed buds, smooth leaf margin, and a rounded sinus. Okay, so more about knowing, so that's, your, that's knowing your resource in terms of identifying it. Uh, red and sugar maple will be the two primary species that you'll be tapping, uh, most of you will be tapping. So other benefits of knowing, your, uh, of knowing your resource is it benchmarks what your resource is, it tells you how much you have uh, and the quality it's in, it allows you to monitor for those changes. Um, it informs your decisions when you're going to be cutting trees as to which trees you have available to cut. If you're making firewood, you'll want to know what your firewood potential is, uh, and it helps you establish targets for what you need. So it may be that you have a current growth rate and you want to achieve a higher growth rate, you'll know what that target is. Uh, you should plan to do uh, inspections for pests. This is becoming increasingly important. You know, 15 years ago, I think we would have said you should look, look keep your eyes open for pests. Now I'm saying you should go out every year um, and learn the learn the pests that are problematic, and make sure you can know how to identify the the symptoms and the signs associated with them. What we're seeing here is um, damage associated with the Asian longhorn beetle. And that's what we see on the left, Asian longhorn beetle. The Asian longhorn beetle will be confused with a non-pest, the pine sawyer beetle. So if you live in an area where there's white pine, you will invariably see the pine sawyer beetle. The difference is when you look essentially between their shoulder blades, and so I've drawn a yellow circle, uh, that, and you look in the center of that circle for both of those, Start with the pine sawyer, there's a, a, a white dot between the shoulder blades of the pine sawyer beetle that's always present. The Asian longhorn beetle, there is not a white dot present. So that's the, that's the way to differentiate that. You also notice the antennae on the Asian longhorn beetle are considerably longer than the body relative to the pine sawyer beetle. Another pest we need to be alert to is the emerald ash borer. Okay, so another aspect of uh, knowing your resources is to uh, keep track of how long it takes your tap holes to close. And I'm making the point here, this is one of my research trees and I was just doing some straight line tapping. That's not a recommended tapping procedure, so I don't want you to think that's the case. But what is recommended is you keep track of how long does it take those tap holes to close. And this is a fairly uh, nice illustration. If you look on the far right, you see a tap hole that's completely closed. In the middle, you see a tap hole that's uh, it's pretty close to completely closed. And then the tap hole on the far left is um, probably 85 or 90 percent closed. So in the current tap that you're seeing, you can see a drop of sap from that spile on the left. Uh, that would be the current tap hole. Okay, the third thing that we want to think about is encouraging good tree growth. Uh, the goal here is really to make sure you have a vigorous crown and healthy roots. If you have a vigorous crown and healthy roots, your tree is going to be growing well. Uh, good growth, not just adequate growth, is critical. Um, and we need to, it may be that we need to thin in the sugar bush to maintain the crown. The limiting factor for crowns where the foliage is, is access to sunlight. Sugar maple as a species is eco ecologically restricted, generally well, restricted is too strong of a word, but it's going to be um, most well developed on well drained, uh, moist, fertile soils. So. The soil conditions are usually not what limits the growth of sugar maple. Now, there are exceptions to that, uh, but more often than not, sunlight, and in all cases, sunlight is going to be a limiting factor. So we may need to thin in the sugar bush to uh, provide more sunlight to the desired crowns, not unlike what you do when you garden. Uh, in everything that we do in the woods, we need to make sure we're avoiding damage to the root systems. Um, this is going to uh, be a, a kind of a regular activity where we're thinning, and we'd typically want to synchronize that anytime we're changing tubing systems, because if you're cutting trees and felling them, you don't want to be dropping them on your tubing systems. 
So uh, if our goal is to have a productive crown, we need to think about the metrics that we're going to use to evaluate those crowns. There's three metrics that we will use. Uh, and the best way to think about these metrics is to think about a relative to sugar production, right? So for maple producers, if you were a timber producer, you would look at these metrics a little bit differently. But for timber, you know, the ideal tree is a yard tree, a roadside tree that has a great big robust crown. So use that kind of as your mental benchmark as you're thinking about what's a productive crown. So one of the metrics we want to look for is low transparency. You see this in the summertime when the foliage is out. Uh, the foliage fills the crown, and so when you're looking, the transparency is not through the leaf, but it's a transparency through the crown that we want to avoid. So we want to have enough foliage in the crown that we can't see through the crown. Where, we, where you get into problems is where you have some kind of a growth decline, whatever whatever causes that particular a growth decline, and the twigs don't elongate fully. So when they don't elongate fully, they tend to be stubby twigs, and so the foliage isn't pushed out as far as it might go. The foliage may still be the same size, but there's a lot of space between the foliage, so there you have an increased transparency. Another metric we want to use is what's called a live crown ratio, and so that's if you look at a tree in profile from top to bottom, we want to see a high percentage of that total length of stem um, occupied by crown. And you think about a roadside tree or a yard tree, that percentage of the of live crown might be on the order of 80 or 90 percent. And in the picture, you see this; these are woods grown trees, and from a sugar bush. And and you can see that you know the the percentage of live crown on some of these maybe is in the 35. The the big tree there maybe has a 35 percent live crown ratio. You can't see the bottoms of the trees; you're just kind of guessing. You know, you look at a crown like this one or a crown like this one; those are maybe 15 percent live crown ratios. So live crown ratio, the higher the live crown ratio, the better production you're going to have. And crown width ratio, so the width of the crown relative to the diameter of the stem. You want that to be on the uh, above 20 to 1 for optimum production. So again, just think about the roadside trees uh, relative to these metrics. You can't achieve roadside tree qualities in the woods. Uh, but but that's what your that's what the ultimate goal is, those metrics. The benefits of having good growth are that we're going to improve tree health. Uh, we may improve sap sugar concentration. There's some conflicting evidence on that. We're probably going to increase sap quantity. Um, most importantly, though, the trees are going to be more resilient. By resilient, I mean they're going to recover more quickly from injury. Injury is a common phenomenon in the life of a tree. Uh, all trees are subject to stress, whether it's drought or defoliation or another tree falling on them and breaking branches uh, or some person coming along and drilling holes into the tree. So the more vigorous those trees are, the more quickly those trees are going to uh, recover from those injuries. And as we'll see here in just a few minutes, the faster the trees are growing, the easier it is to comply with the tapping guidelines. So, and speaking of tapping guidelines, so the tapping guidelines, let me back up here so you're not distracted by that. The way the tapping guidelines work, I'm going to jump ahead maybe, is that um, every time you drill a hole into a tree, so let's say you drill the hole here and it went in however deep you're drilling, and then as you go around that tree over a period of years, by the time you come back to where you started, you need to have accumulated enough new wood so that when you drill another hole, you're not going to tap into this column of discoloration. It's called decay there. That's not the right word. It's a column of discoloration. So those trees, when you tap into that tree, you create this column of staining. Uh, this, this is a normal response of the tree to an injury. It doesn't hurt the tree. It actually is a benefit to the tree because it compartmentalizes and isolates the ability of those microorganisms to spread. 
But what we want to do is we want to make sure that the trees are growing fast enough so that they add on this increment of wood. So what the tapping guidelines assume, and the tapping guidelines say that you can start tapping trees when they're 10 years old. Uh, the Vermont, I think the Vermont conservative guidelines maybe are a little bit uh, larger trees. Some of the organic guidelines maybe are a little bit smaller. Whatever those guidelines are, they have assumptions about how fast the trees are growing. And so that's why we, we need to worry about growth rates on trees. So that's what this slide is looking at. Uh, Mike and I and Steve Childs and several maple producers around New York did a study a few years ago, and we looked at the growth rates of trees in response to thinning, also in, in response to uh, sap sugar. But here we're looking at just how fast are the trees growing. And we broke apart trees that were relatively small, so these are 8 to 10 inches DBH. DBH means diameter at breast height, so that's measuring the height of the diameter of the tree four and a half feet off the ground. We had some like beginner size trees, 10 to 14 inches, and then larger size trees uh, bigger than 14 inches. Then in each of these categories, we separated out control plots, so there was no thinning, so this was a sugar bush where there had never been any thinning, very dense crown. Other areas, we removed 20% of the trees, other areas removed 40% of the trees. And I did some calculations looking at the assumption that we're going to be tapping uh, every inch. Okay, so when we offset, we're going to offset each inch. Uh, and I think we'll see in just a minute with some slides. That's a very tight uh, tapping column. Uh, and then if we're going to drill an inch and a half deep, what we found was the growth rate in the smaller trees, only those uh, smaller trees that had been most heavily thinned had a 40% reduction, had a growth rate that exceeded the threshold, the tapping guideline threshold. So uh, trees, those smaller trees need to be growing a tenth of an inch a year in order to be in full compliance. Uh, only those most heavily thinned did that. As the trees got a little bit bigger in diameter, there's more circumference, and so it takes you longer to get around. So the threshold drops by the time they're 10 to 14 inches. The threshold is 0 0.08 inches in either of the two thinning um, uh, the scenarios work, the 20% and the 40%. Um, in no cases did the control trees, the unthinned trees, uh, meet those guidelines unless you were drilling a very shallow, like a one-inch deep hole, which is, is a shallow hole to drill. All right, so how is thinning done? I need to talk faster. We're going to run out of time. Uh, thinning is done uh, by directional felling. So you're going to be cutting the trees, Directional felling means you decide the direction the trees fall. This provides an emphasis on safety and also improved productivity because when you direct where the tree is going to fall, it's less likely to get hung up in another tree. So it's going to be, you know, when, when a hung tree is problematic because it's, uh, it's downtime, you're not being productive, and it's also unsafe. So... Uh, Game of Logging is a training program that helps ensure that landowners, people like us, know how to safely fell trees. And Game of Logging teaches a felling plan. You can see the elements of that felling plan here. My, my goal here is not to teach you how to fell a tree, but rather just to make sure you know about this educational program called Game of Logging. Um, it is possible to girdle a tree, and you can see that in the lower uh, picture. Uh, that's a double girdle, and what girdling does is it disconnects the roots from the crowns, and to do that, you need to cut into the phloem tissue. So the phloem tissue is just inside the bark, um, and, and, and you're invariably going to cut deeper than the phloem, but the point is you don't need to cut two or three inches into the tree. Once you get past the bark, so you need to know how thick the bark is. Once you get past the bark, you may only need to go a half an inch beyond the inside edge of the bark, and that should be more than enough. The problem with girdling is that at some point the tree is going to fall. You don't know when it's going to fall, and you don't know where it's going to fall. Usually when it does fall, it will fall in pieces, and that's the value of girdling is that if you have a great big tree and you can't safely get it on the ground without damaging other trees, if you girdle it, 
it will die slowly, come down, usually come down in pieces as the trees around it continue to grow. So this is a process that plays out maybe over a decade or more. Um, be leery about doing this near your main lines, near houses. I wouldn't do it at all near a house. Um, but you know, eventually that tree is going to fall and you don't know where it's going to fall. So the question though is which trees do you, if you're going to cut some trees and leave some trees, how do you make that decision? What I recommend uh, retaining during thinning is a mixture of sugar maple, or if you're working in red maple, then red maple. So 75% of your primary maple species and then 25% in other desired hardwoods. High bigger trees are trees defined by having a good healthy crown. Low risk means that they're going to have good integrity to the stem. Ideally, a single stem is better than a forked stem, and the deeper and wider the crowns, as we talked about earlier, are good trees to retain. Uh, you'll want to favor trees that occur in the upper canopy, and if you, if you look at the profile of a forest, you can see trees that occur in the upper canopy, and then trees that usually are shorter and have smaller crowns would be lower canopy. Uh, there's the, the upper canopy trees are going to be best able to respond to thinning. And then there's a secondary consideration. Uh, think about which trees have the best sap sugar concentrations. So if your trees aren't points one through five here, deal with the health of the trees. If you don't have a healthy tree, it's not going to survive, and so it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter how um, you know how sweet the sugar is. You know if you're, the difference is between a you know a 2.0 tree and a 1.7 tree. You want it to be healthy no matter what. All right, I'm going to jump ahead a few slides. As you're working with chainsaws, the key operative phrase here is to be where you are. So if you're running a chainsaw, the only thing you should be thinking about is that chainsaw. Another way to thinking about it or to frame this is to say to be of one mind. The problems happen when you're of too many minds or your or your or your pop-out cartoons are blank and you're not thinking about anything, um, this is where people get hurt. So make sure you have one mind that in that mind is focused on just what you're doing. Okay, let's jump to the next point. You need to be alert for problem plants. Problem plants can be either native, like American beech you see in the upper right-hand corner, or a variety of ferns that you see in the lower left-hand corner. They can be non-native, like multiflora rose or like uh, autumn olive. The problem with these plants is they can either restrict access, they can be quite painful, like multiflora rose, or they can create such a dense layer of vegetation that uh, you see here with the ferns, that dense layer of vegetation, dense layer here, creates shade that limits the regeneration of desired species. So when you get to the point where you're trying to grow the next sugar bush, you're thinking about your children or your grandchildren or some future uh, sugar maker, maker, and you want to make sure you have a young forest growing, these plants can interfere with that. So interfering is the broad category. Invasive means that it's a non-native species. And in, in, so interfering includes all the invasives as well as the native plants. Um, if there needs to be, um, uh, if needed, it should be not in, but if needed, then you need to come up with some kind of a control plan. Uh, you need to know what the desired outcome is. So if you want complete control, which is very difficult, Maybe a time duration control. You want to be able to control the plants for a fixed number of years and then plan for some kind of a replacement species. There's a process known as integrated vegetation management. You can see some of the attributes of IVM. You've heard of IPM, so this is IVM is a process that we use in managing woodlands. All right. Another point is you'll want to apply tapping guidelines. Uh, Mike, I'm sure, will talk about this more if he hasn't already. Uh, it's ideally you're going to know what the stem growth rate is because those, uh, the, your ability to tap is going to depend upon how quickly those trees are growing, as we just showed. Uh, use a spile, the smallest spile diameter that you can use, assuming that you're creating the, the production that you want. So you don't just, there's a deliberate process that you'll go through to pick the correct spile diameter. 
you want to avoid tapping into stained wood, what happens, and we'll see that picture again, uh, where you have that, that, that column of discoloration when the wood heals over the hole, it makes the interior of that tree essentially anaerobic, and so the microorganisms which need oxygen die. If you tap into the stained wood, you've added oxygen, and so you're going to accelerate the decay inside the tree. You want to have a process, we'll, we'll look at pattern tapping. Um, I think it's good to be conservative in tapping trees uh, because, remember, the tree is the factory and you want to make sure that factory is not stressed and to tap efficiently. Uh, there's, uh, when you look at the profile, we talked about upper canopy and lower canopy. The lower canopy trees have very slow growth rates and generally fairly low sap outputs and low sugar outputs. So small diameter trees, lower crown class trees um, are, you know, may not be your best bang for your buck. All right, so the benefits of applying these guidelines is that you end up with happy trees and sustained production. And the, the, it's, it's important to point out here that the tree on the right is not part of that happy tree program. There's too many buckets on that. You're only seeing one side of the tree. There's another two or three more buckets on the other side of that tree. So that's overtapped. We can look, take a closer look at the tree on the left. Uh, and this also has had a fairly high density of tapping. Um, and you can, the, the problems come in is when you get these tap holes that line up vertically, right? So these tap holes like this that line up. And the reason why that's a problem um, is because you're tapping, potentially tapping into stained wood. So here's the picture of, again, this is a, the end section of a maple tree that's been tapped. Uh, you can notice an interesting pattern where the majority, there are about a third of this tree hasn't been tapped for a very long time. This was the oldest tap. So it may be that they had a tubing system that was running on this side of the tree and their drop line was only long enough to get around about a third of the tree, not to get around half the tree. But you can see how these uh, columns of discoloration occur. And then we can see what that looks like um, from a different perspective. So these are boards that are cut from trees that have been tapped. And it's interesting to see where you have these tap holes line up, I'm trying to draw a straight line. Those two tap holes line up. Uh, and over here you have tap holes. You can see this has already right in here that wood has started to decay, and that's not what we want to happen. The problem with tapping into that, besides the health of the tree, is sap doesn't flow through that, that column of discoloration, so you've wasted a tap hole. All right, so here's that uh, cartoonish looking tree. Uh, the, the column of discoloration is up to 32 inches long, so 16 inches above and below the tap hole, and that's evidenced here. You can see these columns, so if there's a tap hole, you can see these columns of decay, uh, columns of stain extend quite a ways up and down through that tree. Uh, and, and the, and the the column of discoloration is closest to the surface near the hole and retracts from the uh, surface as you move further away. And that will, that will bear out. That will be important when we think about tapping patterns. So let's look at these trees just to think about um, the way a tree looks. So this was, I did this slide back in 2005. We start with a 12-inch tree, multiply 12 times pi, 3.14, and you get about 37 38 one-inch columns. So 38 years from now, you're going to come back to where you started, so you need to increment up the wood. So each of these circles represents an increment of wood growth, and as that tree grows, the tap holes, you can see here was tap hole 1, it has this many layers of wood, here's tap hole 8, it doesn't have as many layers of wood, and as you work your way back around, all right, so I'm going to uh, I was, I guess, spreading out every two inches or inch and a half. Uh, you need to have enough wood, and we don't. You can see here, this is the depth. We, we're missing this much wood growth, and so that's going to be a problem. 
Uh, one important thing to do is to use what's called pattern tapping. So if, especially if you're into, a, into new woods and new trees, set up a pattern so you're always moving to the left or to the right. This is the way I do it, Mike. Uh, maybe sharing with you some other strategies. Um, uh, the way we do it at the R-Naught is we always move on an individual tree either to the left or to the right. Our drop lines are long enough so that they can go halfway around the tree, either you know the left side around or the right side around. And we try to have an, um, so the pattern is that you're always moving in one direction. And your offset should equal, I say, should equal eight. So uh, one year, and we, we stole this idea from Mike. Mike started painting near his tap holes. Um, I'm not going to go into it, but that's a fabulous way to keep track of where you've been and where you need to tap in the future. So here was, um, I'm not sure which, whether blue or yellow was the most recent year. We'll say that, that, uh, that yellow was the older hole, right? And so when you tap, you offset by two inches and offset by four inches, so two times four is eight. If you want to come over just one inch, then you need to go up eight inches before you drill your hole. Okay, got it? So uh, rise over run, uh, the product of that should equal eight. Uh, use your brain, right? This is I go out in the woods and we have people that help us tap, um, and it's, it's just really, in, uh, you know, sometimes there's sometimes staff do this, and um, you know it's constantly a struggle to make sure that people are not doing things uh, that just don't make sense. So every time your brain has to be turned on. Now this is this is in some way, you know, this happens. Um, you know, you pick a day when you're out tapping and your tree is covered with snow. If you don't use paint, then it's difficult to. Um, it's difficult to keep track of, of uh, where you want to do your tapping. So Corian wants to know if we'll discuss tapping requirements for organic certification. I will leave that to Mike um, or to others. I'm not, I'm not certain of the details of tapping for organic certification. But it's good. I mean, the point is very well made. You know, if you're trying to comply with a certain system of, of certification, you need to make sure that you know what those standards are. So, all right, point number six, uh, optimize for roads. Roads are your, uh, your entry point. Many of these pictures I got from Gary Graham, who's the maple specialist in Ohio. And a good road plan starts with the topographic map, and so you think about where things are. So you need to plan your roads. Uh, I would start by contacting your soil and water conservation district or working with a forester. Uh, you want to minimize the number of roads because roads are costly and they have to be maintained. You want your roads to be as straight as possible, although an occasional kind of um, meander is good because it allows you to, to move the excuse me, move the water off the road. You want to keep your roads as dry as possible. And you do that by not too steep, but not too shallow, and then keep the water off the road. So you want to move, you want to work with small quantities of slow moving water. So this is a picture of a bad road. You see it's rutted up. Uh, this is frustrating to the maple producer. It's hard on equipment, and it's really hard on the trees. Uh, here's another picture so you can see here was the first tractor that got stuck, second tractor got stuck, and then third tractor trying to get the second tractor unstuck as it was trying to get the first tractor unstuck. The benefits of having good road, you reduce the wear and tear on machinery, you reduce your own frustration, uh, you increase your access during a variety of different seasons if you have good roads, you're going to reduce root damage. Uh, reduce water, water quality issues because of runoff, and you're going to facilitate alternative uses. You can imagine, you know, a road like this isn't going to be any fun for cross-country skiing or mountain biking, um, and so you know you're you're pretty well limited. All right, and then the final point I'll make here is that you want to encourage forest health. If you're working in a, in a forested ecosystem. There's more than just maple trees and sap involved. And so there's some things that you can do, some processes that are just natural to a forest ecosystem that you want to encourage. Uh, some of those ecological processes include things like decomposition, predator-prey cycles, 
competition and then just the dynamics of populations. So now what we're trying to do with management oftentimes is reduce competition for sunlight among the maple trees. Um, but there are other kinds of competition, um, you know, when we're trying to maintain, you know, some level of closed canopy so that we can limit the amount of understory, you know, the briars and the undesirable plants that are growing in the understory, we can use competition to our advantage. Texture is just kind of, if you thought about, you know, if you were huge compared to the trees and what it would feel like to touch the forest. You have things like down logs and snags and brush piles. These add texture or complexity to the forest. And then the forest also provides windbreaks and you may want to develop additional windbreaks on the outside of your sugar bush. Okay, so there are some tools that we can use. Technical assistance, educational assistance, and financial assistance. Technical assistance for the New Yorkers, your technical assistance is primarily going to come through the Department of Environmental Conservation. These are, uh, this is the State Forestry Agency. In Pennsylvania, it's called the DCNR. Um, I think in Vermont, it's Vermont Parks and Forestry or something like that. So every state has a State Forestry Agency. You may know this person as the County Forester. Uh, if you're not sure where to go, call Cooperative Extension and they can get you connected. Uh, foresters can write a plan, they can give you a list of private consulting foresters, and they can give you examples of contracts if you end up having a, some kind of a, of a harvesting uh, um, event in your woods. Private foresters mean they work directly for you, so that the, the, the state foresters technically work for the state, they come prepaid, your tax dollars at work. Private foresters are going to work for you, so you'll have to pay them and they will be able to tell you what their payment schedule is. And there are articles, I've written articles about how to find a good forester. And I've already mentioned soil and water conservation districts are a great resource for technical assistance on soils and roads and topography. Mm. Educational assistance, there's a lot that's, uh, that's available out there. Uh, on the on the forestry side, Cornell Cooperative Extension has a great deal of written material. Uh, Vermont has uh, huge resources of educational materials. Um, uh, Canada has resources. Other states have lots of resources. The North American Maple Syrup Council has resources. They have the um, drawing a blank on the name of the publication that came out about ten years ago. The um, the books, you know, books on it. Mike has a book that he wrote, uh, Sugar Mapers, Makers, Companions. These are all educational resources that you can get um, have, um, access to. Uh, from a woodlot perspective, I offer a monthly webinar, and it's free. It's just like you're watching a webinar today, so I do the same thing on a variety of topics, and then I post those, as you see in the chat pod, to youtube.com slash forestconnect. So you can go back. I've been doing that for almost 10 years. I think there's about 75 webinars that are archived and available there. And then there are organizations. Um, you should certainly join your state maple producers um, association, and you may want to also consider your forest owners association as well. Financial assistance, um, most of it's going to be out of pocket. Sometimes you'll be able to sell some timber. Uh, coordinate that with the setup of your sugar bush. So uh, you want to, before you have tubing systems up, you'd want to think about whether or not you're going to have a timber sale. A professional forester is the one that can give advice on whether or not that's opportune. So they either a state forester or a private consultant. Sometimes, and in some states, there are uh, farm federal dollars available through the NRCS under the EQIP program, and there may be any variety of local grants available, and I just threw out ecotourism and farmer-grower grants through Northeast SARE, so you would need to kind of wiggle these around. Your State Maple Producers Association would be a good point, uh, point of contact for po possible local grants. And then, importantly, cooperative relationships. Get to know the other maple producers in your neighborhood, if you will and see if you can share tools. You know, if, uh, it may be that you know, one person's good with tractors and another person's good with chainsaws, and so you, together you can work and thin the woods and produce firewood or something like that. All right, so that's the final slide, and I just I want to um, 
you know, encourage you to go back. Again, if you haven't saved this, go to the File menu in the upper left-hand corner, go to Save As Document, and then make sure you save it as a PDF file type. Uh, you won't have the narration. The narration will be recorded and posted online uh, as, a, as an archived webinar. Um, but go back through those, figure out where you've been in the woods, and if you haven't developed a management plan, that would be a good starting point because the management plan will help you understand which of the other features are most important for you to be thinking about. So, Corey, and I'm, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. I didn't have the option to save the document. Same here. Well... What I'll do is I will, here's this, I will save it and send it to Mike, and then Mike can send it to you all, or we'll post it to the, to the um, course website. How's that? And if Mike, if I forget to do that, please don't, um, please don't hesitate. So we have like a couple of minutes for any questions, if there's any questions about this presentation. We're going to jump into presentation number two here. Okay, <clears throat> hopefully that made sense to you all. And uh, I'll type my email here. So there's my email address, PJS, Peter John Smallage, 23 at Cornell University. Oop, that went to just, that didn't go where I thought it was going to go. There we go. I just sent that to the... Mm -hmm. All right, now it's going to go to everybody. All right, there's my email address, pjs23 at cornell.edu. If you have questions, don't hesitate to uh, send me an email. The, the web page that I manage, the program that I run is called Forest Connect, so it's connecting people to the forest. and uh, I have lots of resources there, so that's another good place for you to go look in terms of forest management. Forest Connect, that website doesn't have much in terms of sugar maple production, but we have cornellmaple.info. All right, so the question is, how detrimental to a maple tree is it to perform pollarding, a type of coppicing? Hmm, well, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. So that's the caveat. I'll, I'll keep talking, but I'm kind of making this up on the fly. So pollarding is, so the, the visualization that I have of pollarding is what power utility companies do when they have a, a power line that goes through a neighborhood and uh, there's a tree that's nearby. And so they essentially cut it off below the power line and then the 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 cut surface sprouts and sends up shoots. And um, thank you. So the question there is posed to everyone. Um, so I guess detrimental depends upon how you're defining detrimental. Coppicing is a more aggressive form of that where you're cutting the tree off essentially at stump height. So pollarding, so coppicing is, uh, and, and it's designed to make the tree re-sprout and regrow. So the, the coppicing happens at stump height or ground level. Pollarding is something higher than that. So it may not be at the height of power lines. It would depend upon what uh, objective that you had, either uh, an aesthetic objective or um, it may be that you're trying to rejuvenate a tree and keep it tall enough so that it's not browsed by livestock. I would say that, so I guess I'm, I'm not sure the context of why you would want to do this, I would say for the purposes of, of sap production and sugar production, this is not something you would want to do at all, or if you did it, to do it very infrequently and to know exactly why you're doing it. I, I can't think of a reason why you would want to do it. Um, the, the challenge is when you do this is that you're forcing the tree to draw energy reserves from the roots to push out a whole new suite of branches. And so that energy that's going into branch production is not energy that's available 
uh, to be retained as sugar in the sap. So I think that if you did that on a on a frequent basis, um, th that you would see a drop in production. So that's the I guess that's kind of the so harvest wood for now without killing the tree or sap, sap later on. Oh, I see. Um, I would say um, if you want to harvest wood, cut other trees. Uh, you'll want those so the the volume of wood. So you're, when you, when you cut the tree, this assumes that the tree that you're working with is has a reasonably healthy crown. Um, the the longer you let that tree grow, the bigger the crown it's going to be, the bigger the stem it's going to be. The stem, I think of the stem as kind of a sponge. Bigger the sponge, the more liquid you can hold. And uh, all that you're going to, so if you, if you cut it back, you will accelerate the growth and you'll have very fast accumulation of wood, but it's fast accumulation of wood on a small stem. So you're not, I don't, I'm not sure that you're going to be gaining any advantage to that. So if you want to access the wood, um, access to what I would say, you know, harvest other trees, uh, not the trees that you plan to tap. So I did do some studying in like, and this is way off topic, on coppicing from a mushroom production. So that's a, I under, my understanding is that's fairly common to do uh, in Europe where they're growing alder and oaks and hazel for production of bolts for mushrooms, but that's a very that's a very different system and it's not it's not working from the perspective of a of a sap producing system.